You feel bored. Let me grab the phone to be entertained. I feel sad. Let me watch dog or baby videos to laugh and feel happy. Instead of like sitting there and experiencing the feeling in the present moment. Would you say that's a fine example of what you mean by change? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Good, good, yes. good. I, does this mean I get a Stanford degree? <laughs> you do. An, an honorary degree from my okay. clinic. <laughs> you all heard it here first. Dr. Lemke says I'm a Stanford grad. <laughs> Dr. Lemke, thank you so much for coming on RealPod. Are you recording this from Stanford today? Yes, I'm here in my office on the campus. I love that. So I grew up right near Palo Alto. So I used to go to the Stanford volleyball games and the Stanford mall. So nostalgia. It's such a great area. But I'm really excited to have you on the show. I fell in love with you first when I heard you on Armchair Expert. It was a fantastic conversation. And I had been meaning to reach out. But it wasn't until an experience I had a few weeks ago where I was trying to read a book that I really like. And I was Mm -hmm. sitting in my room, sat down to read the book, and I flipped my phone over and I set it on the other side of the bed. And like every two pages, I felt myself reaching for the phone to see if someone needed me, someone texted me, something happened. I started to notice I am subconsciously like physically grabbing my phone, opening it up. My fingers hit the buttons without me even thinking about what to do. And then I posted this video, of course, the irony of that. If you want to know me a little bit, I pretty much post everything I feel, which we can dissect that issue in a bit. (laughs) But um, (laughs) I had so many people relating. I cannot Mm -hmm. put my phone down. I cannot put Mm -hmm. my phone down. Mm -hmm. And so that got me over the edge to have you on, to have this conversation. And I'm sure that's a phenomenon that you're not unfamiliar with. (laughs) Yeah. And you described it very well. I guess maybe the first thing that I would want to say is that it's not necessarily a bad thing that through our devices, we are connecting to other people and doing it frequently and wanting to do it frequently and having this kind of perpetual conversation because we are you know, at the end of the day, highly social creatures. We were meant to move in these tribes or hives, whatever you want to call them. It makes a lot of sense that, you know, we want to stay connected with each other. But I guess the concern is the extent to which the medium itself is driving the desire for connection and whether it's really leading to being more connected or whether it's just kind of internally reinforcing, but not ultimately healthy or adaptive. And so I think that that's really the question. You know, in the incident you described where you're reading a book that you say you were really interested in and wanted to read, and you were highly distractible, and the phone being there was part of the distraction, there are actually some studies now showing that if you give somebody a hard like math problem or other type of problem to solve, and you have them put their phone down either next to them on the counter or in their back pocket or in another room, that they will do better solving that problem if it's in the other room. They'll perform in a medium range when it's in the back pocket, and they will perform the worst when it's on the counter right next to them. So that really does, you know, tell us it's just a small piece of evidence and it's only one small study. But I think it's not inconsistent with the phenomenology that we're observing, which is that these devices, for all of their wonders, can detract from our ability to focus maybe kind of a vehicle for a kind of counterfeit connection, you know, all of the connections, you know, the kind of sharing all of your emotions online. Is it really leading to intimacy or is it sort of that your limbic system has sort of become a parade for other people to watch? I don't know. Yeah, it's super fascinating to think about. And I feel confident that I have really deep, intimate relationships with my best friends, my family, my husband. And it's those relationships and the vulnerability and transparency that I have in my life that's so fulfilling that I hope to bring to other people almost Mm -hmm. by modeling it with recognition of the struggles I've had with mental health or with body image or with an eating disorder and hoping that the more that I can talk about it, the less shame that they'll feel. However, because it's my profession and I'm always posting, 
there's this inevitable desire to like share everything all the time. And it's almost Mm -hmm. like if I don't, then the engagement might go down or they'll Mm -hmm. find someone else to follow. And then I don't have a business, but I love it. You know, one Mm -hmm. of my questions was going to be the difference between creating versus consuming. I know a lot about this conversation when it comes to dopamine is the consumption. Mm -hmm. And I almost feel like I'm doing more of the creating, although I also find myself mindlessly consuming. (laughs) Well, I think even on the creation side, we're vulnerable, right? Because when you put something out in the world, if you get a positive response, it's incredibly intoxicating. And then, you know, you want to do it again and again and again, and you want to check how people are responding. And and you might even argue that as harmful as the negative responses can be, and of course we see that too with, with in some cases, you know, tragically deadly consequences. The constant adulation is also a real trap. You know, then you have to kind of keep chasing it and keep your numbers up and keep your rankings or whatever it is. And then there's also kind of the anxiety that creeps in. Will I be as interesting tomorrow as I am today? Will I be able to maintain, you know, will I be able to produce something as, you know, riveting as, you know, what I produced yesterday? So I do think, you know, there's a way in which it's a very strange world. Relating to everything. And actually, I think about this past Christmas, I went to spend it with my husband's family. And I'm actually fairly good at leaving my phone behind when I need to. If there's not service or we go to dinner, I'm sometimes the weird one that's telling my husband who works in real estate, let's leave our phones and have a night without them. But we'll be doing something and I'll think, oh, I want to record this. Oh, wait, I don't have my phone. It's like that automatic thing. But Mm -hmm. what I was going to say is I noticed that that week especially, maybe it was because it was the holidays and I wasn't with my own family. But whenever I'm not with my phone, it's like my energy can't reach the same heights. Mm -hmm. And as I studied some of your work and I listened to some of your conversations, I know you talk about the way that the more we seek dopamine, it's like the worse we're going to be left, right, as a result. So I was hoping you could explain that to me. And I mean, have I, for lack of a better term, like effed myself that I'm not going to be able to experience the same happiness if like a viral video that goes off is the same as like my best friend's birthday dinner in my mind, (laughs) which that comes around once a year, right? Whereas a viral video I can try to hit every day. Right, right. Well, you know, I I don't know exactly what's happening in your mind. I I think that, you know, if we are going to analogize this to, you know, what happens in the brain as people become addicted to drugs and alcohol, what we see over time is that the kind of fire hose of dopamine release in the reward pathway that is the result of potent intoxicants ultimately leads the brain to go through this process called neuroadaptation where in order to bring the brain back down to baseline levels of dopamine firing, we essentially downregulate dopamine transmission, for example, by involuting postsynaptic dopamine receptors, reducing the numbers, not just to baseline levels of dopamine, but actually below baseline into this dopamine deficit state, which is the come down, the hangover, the blue Monday, the withdrawal. Now, if we wait long enough between use, eventually our brains get the message, okay, there are no more intoxicants coming in and eventually go back up to our baseline firing. But if we continue to consume that highly reinforcing substance or behavior over long periods of time, then our brains have to essentially achieve a new hedonic or joy set point where they then enter theoretically a kind of chronic dopamine deficit state in order to compensate for the constant stimulation And that dopamine deficit state can be akin to a clinical depression. The universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance or behavior are anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, and craving. And craving is often manifested as intrusive thoughts and preoccupation with our drug of choice, whether it's a substance or a behavior. So we could hypothesize that, although it's great that you give up your phone and other devices for the week that you're with your in-laws, you're probably in withdrawal, some degree of withdrawal from technology during that time. If you could go longer, like more than 14 days on average, then you would probably eventually come out of that and find that you were feeling good again and, and probably potentially even feeling better than you, you, know, you have for a while. I don't know what your baseline uh, mood is like, but 
that is what we see in our patients who develop addiction to the internet technology devices, digital media. So when we think about withdrawal and then you use the word addiction, obviously, you know, if you're having a withdrawal, it's because you were addicted in some way. What does it really mean to be addicted? What's the recipe? It's so weird. Like, would I say I'm addicted to my phone? Yes, in like casual terms with my friends, but then talking to a psychiatrist and expert such as yourself, that makes it sound big and scary. And like, I couldn't live without it, where I like to think I could live without it, but I don't want to. <laughs> This is a really great point. I mean, first of all, these are behaviors that are highly contextualized in the environment and the culture that we live in. And to some extent, what we're talking about is something biological that's happening in the brain. But to another extent, it's something that we determine as a society is either healthy and adaptive behavior or is not. So for example, you know, there are certain types of compulsive behavior like workaholism that our society celebrates and that we wouldn't call out, even if you could say from a phenomenological point of view that this person is manifesting the same types of behaviors as somebody who's addicted to drugs and alcohol. So how do, how do we define addiction? Addiction is the continued compulsive use of a substance or behavior despite harm to self and or others. And it really is crossing that line into harm, whether we see the harm or not. Somebody's got to see the harm that it identifies almost all mental health disorders, right? Because almost every mental health disorder is a spectrum of sorts. When is sort of having some faint auditory hallucinations schizophrenia? And when is it just sort of, oh, wow, that was weird. When is sort of using being on your phone a lot, a bona fide form of pathophysiology and addiction? And when is it just sort of, wow, well, that's your job. You're on your phone a lot. And you think about your phone a lot. We don't have any brain scans or blood tests to diagnose addiction. We base it on the phenomenology of these patterns over time that are fairly similar. People start out using their drug or behavior for fun or to solve a problem. If it works, they continue to go back to it over time. Uh, often tolerance develops. They need more of the drug in more potent forms to get the same effect. And then they may progress to a point where they're putting all of their available time, energy, money into getting the drug, using the drug, hiding drug use. Then they start to have serious consequences of the drug and yet they don't stop or they try to stop and they're unable to, which brings us to a good way to test whether or not you've developed some sort of physiologic and or psychologic addiction. I actually don't like that distinction because anything psychological is also physical. A good way to tell is actually to try to give it up for four weeks to recognize that the first two weeks you will probably be in withdrawal, but that's not the kind of psychological state that you'll be left in with for the long haul, but it's hard. But if you can make it to, you know, week three or four, you know, then you can sort of determine for yourself, okay, or maybe somebody else could determine, wow, you're really different now when you're not on your phone all the time. And it's been really a, a pleasure to be with you again, compared to when you're on your phone. I don't know. Well, there's a lot coming up for me as you describe this. I think in the beginning of your explanation, right, when you mentioned like harm to others or yourself, I'm thinking, mm -hmm. oh, that's not me. I'm not mm -hmm. harming someone else. I'm not harming me. And then as you kept going, I thought, well, is it harmful the way in which I compare myself to other people every single day? Mm -hmm. And then maybe that creates negative thought patterns. And then I have really bad mental health week simply because of something I saw or read or received online on Monday. You could draw the conclusion that that's harm to myself based on the use of my phone. But then when I think about like, I feel like my energy is great and my relationships with people are great and there are important moments I can be without. For example, on my own wedding day, I didn't want to see or touch my phone. Because it's my job, I hired someone else to post for the day, but like I wasn't talking to them, working with them or doing it myself and it's like the best day ever. So I almost feel comforted in knowing like I can get rid of it at times, but if people are trying to strike a balance, at least for me, it's unrealistic to put my phone away for a month. That's like asking someone else, don't work at your job for a month. But could I stop going on it after 7 p.m. at night and sit in the silence and actually focus on the TV? You know what's funny? People saying they can't even watch TV anymore. They need TV in the background and the phone at, right. as like a side right. thing. And can I try to delay 
the gratification in the first two hours of my day abstaining from use of my phone. Definitely. Those are things I could do. And the fact that I know that and I've wanted to and I do it and then sometimes I don't probably proves that, you know, I really need to be a bit firmer with those boundaries. First, I would say that those kinds of boundaries you're talking about, I I refer to them as self-binding. That is the ways that we create both literal and metacognitive barriers between ourselves and our drug of choice, whether it's a substance or a behavior, as a way to press the pause button between desire and consumption. Space, time, and meaning are three categories of self-binding. A space-related self-binding is where you literally have the drug separated from you, either not in your house, when it comes to your phone, not in the bedroom, or you might delete apps so that they're, you know, you don't go on certain apps or certain websites, or you might make it less potent in some way and create a kind of separation, turn off notifications. So you're not constantly being pinged. In terms of time, we can use time as a construct to bind ourselves. That's things like, you know, digital intermittent fasting, trying to have a whole day, one day per week, like a digital Sabbath where you're not on the phone or even within a single day saying, I'm not going to go on until 9 a.m. in the morning, or maybe you don't use time per se, like a clock time you might use, like crossing a finish line. Like I'm not going to go on until I've exercised, eaten breakfast, brushed my teeth, made my bed, you know, and then you say, okay, once I finish those things, then I can go on. And then the last kind of category is, is meaning. And this is where we conceptualize sort of how we're using and the meaning behind it. Am I using according to my value. When we think about harms, a really important category of harms is opportunity costs, right? What are the things I'm not doing, like reading this book that I want to read because I'm so compulsively on my device constantly? Or, you know, with people with severe internet and technology addiction who, you know, have to work in their jobs, one of the meaning constructs is I will use this device as a tool, but not as a drug. So therefore I will go on to do work, but I will never use the internet or technology for entertainment or to change the way I feel. So that's a very stark bottom line, you know, never use the internet for entertainment. That means really no YouTube videos, no pornography, no video games, no movies, but that's what some people do. And that that's what I try to do in my personal life. I use all three of these, but I try hard to not use the internet. And I'm not successful um, 100%. I, I have days when I'm not successful, but I try not to use the internet for too much entertainment unless it's watching with other people. And I try not to use it to change the way I feel. The other thing that I would add, and this is just something I would think about for you. So it's interesting that the day that you recall when you were not on your phone was your wedding day. So that's a day when you are absolutely 100% the center of attention. I wonder if you would, I wonder, I just wonder, and this is not yeah. a criticism of you. This is really a, more a criticism of our culture. I wonder if if you would be able to, you know, not be on your phone and not crave it and be a background person for a day. I love this prompt. <laughs> I love it. If anything comes up during this conversation and you want to therapist me, please, it's welcome. I love that idea. And I think that'd be a great thing for me to try. There are certainly Sundays where my husband and I go to the farmer's market and, and, you know, I leave my phone behind. So I'm not being fawned over, but I think you're correct. Like, you know, there's so many hits on the wedding day happening that you don't need it from somewhere else. It's interesting because when I first was using social media and I had a lot of body image issues and I felt shitty about my body I would like pull out a photo where I thought my body looked good and I'd post it and then you get likes and you get comments and then you feel better about yourself Mm -hmm. because people are saying you look pretty or you look skinny or you look this actually I realized that connection and that I was Mm -hmm. seeking validation externally and then that's what sent me on the path of how do I take back the power to validate Mm. myself when it comes Mm -hmm. to my body. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting how these things then sneak back in in various ways of like, how can I be the best body image advocate? How can Mm -hmm. I create content that people praise as helpful for them on their recovery journeys? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It comes back wearing a mask. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what's great is that you, you have a really nice ability to observe these phenomena as they're happening to you. And you have a lot of insight, which is great. 
the internet has a way of doing that, of sort of it's become as a house of mirrors. And we're constantly, I mean, it's in some ways very natural for us to be interacting with our environment, defining ourselves based on these interactions. But there is a place that we all have, which is a kind of grounded place where we have this sense of ourselves in the deep quiet without being a reflection of another human being. And that's the piece I think we're losing. We're very disconnected in a lot of ways from that part of ourselves. And I think it's a really important, because you can always go back to that. You know, you can always go back to this kind of core sense of your own self, your energy, your rhythm. And it's a place really where we're very free also. Not that we stop caring what other people think. We, we always care what other people think. I don't care who you are, how old you are. We're wired for connection and social contact. And so we will always be aware of others. But there is a way in which we have to you know, strike a balance um, between that and really this kind of, uh, okay, well, who, who am I separate from reflecting back you know, the image that other people see of me? I'm sure you're familiar with the quote. It's something like, all of humanity's problems comes back to the inability of a man to sit quietly in a room. You know that quote? Yes. Who is that again? I forget. I'm going to have to yeah. uh, check it out. But it's something like it all comes back to the inability of a person to sit in a room quietly with no distraction. Right. Are you familiar with Eckhart Tolle's work? A little bit. Of course, I know the name, but I know he's made a big contribution to the sort of being mindfully aware and being in the moment. Yes. So I'm actually right now doing a second podcast with my best friend. The book that I was referencing was A New Earth by Eckhart. We recap it every Friday, but I always feel like I've been self-aware, but it's really creating the space between the consciousness and then like the gut egoic reaction. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just helped me a lot in the kind compliment you gave me of like being able to recognize my behaviors and my actions and try to do mm -hmm. it without judgment. But sitting in stillness and feeling is really hard for people. And I think the distraction of the phone is almost like the medicine in a way, like maybe mm -hmm. reading the book for me, it is really dense and it's just easier mm -hmm. for me to look at my phone and do something silly and stupid because mm -hmm. otherwise I have to kind of face my inner self if I keep reading, you know? Right. Or, or even just, you know, if it's a difficult text, it's a cognitive load, right? So you have to process it. So you're going to get to a point where you, you need like a little pause or a break. And that's where we've all reflexively gotten to a point where we then turn for our, our mind candy, whatever form that takes, instead of just letting the pause itself be the break. What's the difference between dopamine and serotonin? Both are neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are the chemicals that bridge the gap between neurons that allows for fine tuning of the electrical circuits. The, there's a lot of overlap between them. They're both really important for the experience of emotions. And by the way, we only have really the very beginnings of understandings of how these neurotransmitters work in the brain and how the brain works. It's still a great mystery in, in many ways and very complicated. But if we were broadly going to differentiate, to just simplify it. Serotonin is thought to be uh, very much connected to the experience of social connection. So for example, LSD and other psychedelics cause a huge surge or discharge of serotonin, which is why people often experience this kind of expansiveness and this love and this dissolution of the self merging with the other. Whereas dopamine is really the kind of final common pathway for all rewarding substances and behaviors, and it has other functions as well, but it's thought to be key for motivation, for processing novel and important stimuli in the environment that are important for survival. So it's the, the sort of neurotransmitter that says, you know, hey, pay attention to this. This is really important. Obviously, both of those are pleasuring for the mood and you had a very viral video where you said people are more depressed more anxious more suicidal than ever because of this relentless pursuit of pleasure what is exactly this relentless pursuit of pleasure is it the hits from serotonin and dopamine and why is it so relentless what's made us this way 
So it's funny because that phrasing has an active verb, you know, that we are pursuing, but really the, the whole point there is that we've changed our world. We've created an ecosystem in which almost all human substances and behaviors have become drugified in some way. What makes something drugified? Well, it, it's potent. It releases a lot of dopamine and other feel-good neurotransmitters uh, in that reward circuitry. And we have easy access to it, which we do now to almost every drug. It's available in abundant quantities. TikTok, for example, never runs out. And there's perpetual novelty. So dopamine is very sensitive to newness and novelty. And we can take you know anything and kind of make it slightly different. The AI algorithms that learn us are actually doing this. They're pushing content to us that's similar to what we've watched before, but slightly novel that keeps us clicking and swiping. This is the way in which our environment, we, we have created this ecosystem, which makes us all more vulnerable to these kinds of compulsive addictive loops. What's the relationship between, let's say, parents who are addicted to a drug and then the child is not? or siblings who have completely different interests or addictions, but they have the same genetic makeup? First of all, I would say that the sort of addiction gene or the, the complex array of genes that makes someone more vulnerable to the problem of addiction is endemic in the population and has been around for millions and millions of years, probably because you know, millions of years ago or even hundreds of years ago, it was highly adaptive to have those genes. So if you're living in a world of scarcity, you would definitely want in your tribal group, those people who are willing to walk further, work harder, do whatever it took to get the object of their desire or the things that they and the tribe needed to survive. That's the addiction gene, right? So in today's environment, it's a liability, but thousands of years ago, probably wasn't a liability, right? It was a plus. When we say something is sort of endemic in the environment, that means it's it's so positive and crucial for overall survival that you're going to see it manifested in many different family trees. It's not just going to be in one place. And we all have the same ancient motivation and reward circuitry. So, you know, anybody to expose to enough of their drug of choice will get addicted. That's why you can have parents who are addicted and a child who is not, and also parents who are not addicted and a child who is, right? Because these genes will pop up. Uh, they're not going away anytime soon. Plus, again, in an ecosystem that's addictogenic, we're all more vulnerable. Having said that, even beyond genes, and genes account for only about you know 50% of the risk of addiction. The other part is nurture, the way that we're raised, and then also neighborhood the world that we find ourselves in. And when we think about nurture, if you have parents or role models or a peer group who are actively manifesting addictive behaviors, you are more likely to also adopt those types of behaviors. If you have parents who are, on the other hand, have with you a healthier attachment, know where you are, what's under your bed and in your backpack and who you're hanging out with, those kids are showing uh, lower rates of addiction, right? So chaotic environment, poor attachments, even contextualized things that are not necessarily psychological, but simple access is a risk factor. Poverty is a risk factor. Unemployment is a risk factor. So there are lots of different risk factors. Also, aren't there people, of course, who see what's modeled to them, absolutely despise it, and then go in the complete other direction? Yeah, but it's hard to know what the other direction is. I mean, you know, um, it could be that they say to themselves, well, my parents were alcoholics, so I'm never going to drink, but who knows, did they really bypass the addiction problem or is it just manifesting, you know, with another drug or in another way? Right. And then it is the starkness of I'll never touch a drink affecting their social relationships, their overall happiness of their life because of the fear of what would happen if I did this. I mean, it's cool is probably not the right word, but just to get older and think about the ways that our parents have impacted the way that we act. I frequently do right. things and think I'm literally being my mother. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. That definitely, it makes sense for sure. And of course, you know, we can't always a hundred percent know. And I even thought just in the very beginning when you said we can't actually like diagnose or take a test to quantify or label addiction when it's there, it's really vague. And I think that's probably why a lot of people experience denial, right? And the inability mm -hmm. to acknowledge what they're going through. Why do you think 
people are most resistant to acknowledge their addictions? Well, I mean, the state of being addicted is a state of being ambivalent about use. You know, on the one hand, people want to quit. On the other hand, they feel like they couldn't live without their drug. So inherent in the disease of addiction is very deep ambivalence uh, about it. Because once people become addicted, it's not really working for them anymore. You know, hence the definition, the consequences, right? And they don't even like it in many instances. They don't get pleasure from it. Pleasure has long gone away. It just speaks to the incredible sort of hijacking of those motivational reward systems in the disease of addiction that really defines, uh, you know, the, the process, the fact that people want to stop and they can't. Yeah, I think ambivalence, denial, it's all just deeply part of the disease process. Also, if you think about it, if you hurt your arm or you have problems with your heart or your liver, that's not your brain, right? But if you have a disease that's in your brain, of course, it's going to be this wily thing that's going to be difficult to wrap your hands around. And do you believe everyone has a poison, but they just might not know what it is? Or do you think there are some people who can't get addicted to anything? I'm starting to believe more and more that we all have a drug of choice. Maybe we just haven't met it yet, but it's it's coming soon. That's partially my own from my own experience. You know, I, I thought I hadn't inherited the addiction gene because I had tried a number of different intoxicants and did not get any reaction from them at all. Like no reinforcing positive or negative benefit or negative, but just not good. But then, you know, midlife, as I talk about in my book, I discovered the Twilight Saga and I got pretty addicted to vampire romance novels, which then progressed over time to Frank erotica, especially as mediated by, you know, a Kindle and electronic reader where I became a complete chain reader. I could buy one romance novel as soon as the other. And it was a minor addiction. Like I never had to see a professional when I realized, but that took some doing the realization because I didn't really see it happening, even though I'm an addiction psychiatrist. But when I realized that it had become a problem, I was able to stop, you know, on my own. So you could argue I wasn't really addicted. And even if I was, it was very minor, but nonetheless, that same pattern manifested itself in me. And so we are seeing many, many more people without any prior problems with drugs and alcohol, coming in with social media addiction, video game addiction, online shopping addiction, you know, pornography and masturbation addiction, YouTube, Netflix, TikTok addiction, right? This sort of very potent moving image known as the movie is really the drug of choice for many of us. So email, you know, things like that, online chess, stuff that you don't even really think could be addictive, but for that particular person's makeup, some people maybe are more addicted to sort of aversive or painful stimuli. You know, people are getting addicted to a lot of different things. And as you list all of that out, it makes me think, isn't that also just like part of life and we're all going to have things that we love more than other things? Because addiction has that negative connotation. I mean, is it the worst thing if someone likes painting? You know what I'm saying? Like, when do we know it's just a hobby that brings you joy? Does that when we go back to the behavior that causes harm to yourself or others? That's it. That's it. Right. But I think it's good to revisit that because, yeah, you, people have passions, they have hobbies, deep, deep, beloved interests. And I'm not saying that any of that is bad. But I am suggesting that the medium through which we pursue many of these hobbies. And the drugification of the world today makes even things that used to be healthy and adaptive uh, more vulnerable to uh, the, the process of addiction. Like, let's take exercise. I mean, exercise is something that generally, you know, modern people don't get enough of. But for those people who are into exercise, it's now become much easier to get addicted to exercise because we've got these machines and we can see the numbers and we've got social media sites where now we compare ourselves to other people. And all of that creates a kind of potent drug where before it was just exercise. What I'd love to do before I let you skedaddle back to your duties at Stanford is come up with maybe like a challenge. I know a lot of lovely RealPod listeners related to just my feelings about my phone. 
tell me if you think this is not the best idea, but if we don't go to the extreme of like everyone get rid of your phone for a month because maybe it's unrealistic. When I was in high school, we had an app with our class schedule. I mean, restaurants have QR codes. It's kind of like, which I don't don't like that either because I don't want to be looking at it anymore. You know what I'm saying? The blue light gives me a headache. But what's a simple, maybe slightly more than that, going to be kind of difficult challenge that we could try for a week once finishing this episode, myself included. Okay. So I would suggest starting the week with a 24 hour digital Sabbath. And let me just define that. That means do not touch a digital device or look at a screen, including a TV for 24 hours. That may involve powering down your phone, powering down your laptop, letting people in advance know that you're going to be out of touch another way that they can reach you, but literally separating ourselves from the devices for 24 hours. It's a lot harder than you might think. I mean, when you said not even the TV or the computer or the, does that mean, what about when you get in your car and there's a little screen in there? (laughs) Right. Well, if it's for backing up, that's probably okay. Okay, Um, cool. But that's not all. That's okay. not all. That's just give the us, first step. Give right. Us more. That's just give the first step. So after that 24 hour digital Sabbath, then for the next week, only use your device as a tool. That means only use it for what you have to use it for to communicate with the people that you have to communicate or for work. Do not use it for entertainment and do not use it to change the way you feel and do that for seven days. And, you know, journal, see how it goes. I love this challenge accepted. And I want to double click <laughs> on the, to change the way that you feel. I yeah. think that is such a truth about, I think a lot of people my age and just all ages is like, you feel bored. Let me grab the phone to be entertained. I feel sad. Let me watch dog or baby videos to laugh and feel happy. You know, I miss someone. Let me look at photos instead of like sitting there and experiencing the feeling in the present moment. So would you say that's a fine example of what you mean by change? Perfect. Perfect. Good, good, good. Does this mean I get a Stanford degree? You do. (laughs) And an honorary degree from my clinic. (laughs) You all heard it here first. Dr. Lemke says I'm a Stanford grad. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I'm excited for this challenge. If you're listening to this episode, our Sabbath is going to be Sunday. So you have like some time. This is coming out on Wednesday to prepare, cry, freak out, whatever you got to do. I'm going to be doing it with you and then we'll have a reflection. Dr. Lemke, thank you so much. And your book, Dopamine Nation, is amazing. Actually, my friend's boyfriend was reading it when I was with them recently. And he was like, I'm reading a book on dopamine. I said, by Dr. Lemke? He goes, yeah, how did you know that? Like he thought it was, <laughs> he was so impressed. I was like, I'm going to be meeting her soon. So great book. That's after I finish Eckhart Tolle's. I'm deep diving into that. And thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Take good care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of RealPod. If this hit home or helped you in some way, send it to a friend, a teammate, roomie, share the love, share the realness. New episodes of RealPod come out every single Wednesday. So make sure you are subscribed to this podcast so you never miss an episode. 